Okay, good afternoon. Let's uh, get started. Everybody can hear me in the back? Okay, good. Uh, topic for today uh, is uh, finding bugs. In the, almost in the last, you know, almost five, six, seven lectures, uh, we talked a lot about sort of making boxes that contain, you know, code if there's actually something wrong with it. And so the idea being that, you know, if there may be some bug that can lead to an exploit, hopefully we contain the code sufficiently so that that code can't really get out of its box. Whereas in, in many ways, lab two, what we have privilege separation, is about that plan, trying to contain bugs. So the alternative approach, of course, is you know, try to get rid of bugs uh, and, uh, or complementary approach. And so the, today's lecture is mostly uh, is about that topic. Now, of course, you know a lot, you know, since you're all programming, you know a lot about bugs and actually how to find them. And so what we're going to do is uh, talk a little bit about sort of more advanced or more novel approaches to uh, bug finding. In particular, we're going to talk about symbolic execution. Um, and it's a very interesting approach to finding, uh, bug fi uh, finding bugs, and particularly sort of tailored to finding deep bugs, you know, bugs that you can't find using sort of ordinary testing or perhaps f uh, fuzzing. And so, uh, and in some ways, you know, it's intellectually interesting because, you know, if you think about the, the basic approach, uh, which is basically exploring all the branches or all the paths in your program uh, using symbolic execution, it seems like that should not be able to work, you know, for any sort of real world big program because, you know, you're going to have path explosion. And yet, you know, the, you know, the paper basically right, describes a bunch of techniques that actually makes it possible to do, you know, sort of that exploration. Uh, the other reason why this lecture is reasonably important uh, is it actually is the topic of lab three. So in lab three, you will actually use uh, symbolic execution to find some bugs in Zubar, uh, the same code it being using in lab one and lab two. Okay. Good. Now, the theme of this lecture, in some ways, and there's a little bit of a, a generalization, is that a bug is, you know, roughly equivalent to an exploit. Uh, and that's, of course, not true. You know, not every bug is an exploit. Uh, but from a security point of view, if you want to sort of be defensive, you know, that's not a bad way to think about it. You know, maybe it's not like one bug that can lead to an exploit. Maybe if you line up the bugs in the right way, you have a number of them, then you can get an exploit. Uh, but so basically any bug, though, is sort of a worry and a reason to be, uh, you know, worried that there might be an exploit. And so for the first degree, or to the first degree, we can just assume bugs are bad and maybe lead to exploits, so we really want to get rid of them. Um, now, I should say that if you had a bug, and actually finding the exploit is typically hard. So it's not the case that, like, oh, you have a bug and then basically you have the exploit. You know, finding the exploit is often hard. Um, and you have gotten a little bit of a sense of that in, you know, lab one, you know, where you know, the buffer overruns, uh, you know, even finding the bug, you know, it's not completely tricky, correct, the right buffer overrun, then exploiting the buffer overrun might actually be tricky too. And so it's actually not that, you know, that straightforward. And this isn't generally true. And so what typically happens is that, you know, companies, governments, uh, they encourage researchers or you know, computer or security engineers to basically find those exploits. Um, and so, you know, you know, we've seen it a couple times, you know, almost every series company has actually a team working on trying to figure out, like, what is exploitable, you know, what the bugs are in the software that can lead, you know, to exploit. There's a huge uh, research community that, you know, looks, you know, at all kinds of open source software or closed software, trying to find basically bugs or may perhaps, you know, try to find the exploits. Um, in, in particular, not only that, the general sentiment is that, you know, we want to learn from them. Uh, 
And so, in fact, what the typical protocol is that, you know, for the security researchers that you know, are looking at bugs is to actually, or ex exploit, is to actually report them and document them. And in fact, there's a whole community uh, effort to actually collect those bugs and uh, you know, categorize them uh, so that we can learn from them. So, for example, uh, here's the, uh, a website. Uh, it's run by uh, MITRE. This is the Common Vulnerability and Exposures website, where basically, you know, people report, you know, bugs you know, that they found that potentially can lead to exploit, and they're sort of carefully recorded. And so here I just searched for all the bugs that mention Linux, and you know, you see there's basically a long, long, long list of CVEs, as they're called. They're all assigned a unique number, and then they descri describe what the bug is, and in some cases, you know, they you know, explain exactly you know, how they can actually be exploited and so that people can learn and fix their code, et cetera, et cetera. And there are other websites that take that as input again and basically, you know, uh, issue warnings. So, for example, here's the uh, NVD website. It's run by NIST that basically looks at these CVEs and actually categorizes them as, for example, high or medium, meaning, like, the security impact of this bug is... Uh, either, you know, can sometimes can be low, uh, and sometimes here, for example, there's one, you know, there's a buffer overrun in the SSL authentication code, and that is, you know, marked as a critical security bug. Right, so there's, uh, the whole community has, sort of interesting, if you think about it, like the security research community or the security community in general actually is very open about bugs and exploits, and mostly to encourage, you know, people to learn from it and also to fix their software. So generally, you know, you might think, oh, this is really high risk, right? You know, the attacker, you know, go to the website, the attacker finds all the bugs, and, you know, go, go uh, and uh, can exploit it, can exploit the software. But typically, what the way it's worse, there is some, you know, protocol for disclosure. So when a security uh, researcher finds a bug or a particular exploit, they typically, you know, your responsibility is to actually contact, you know, the supplier of the software and give them at least, you know, some time period to actually fix their software before actually making it open. And so, for example, a common number is two months or three months, you know, before you actually make anything public about it. And this encourages, of course, the vendors to actually really fix it because after two, three months, it will be public. And so there's a real uh, force uh, to actually uh, do something about it. Does that make sense? So maybe you, find, you might find this slightly unusual. Okay? You were thinking security bugs, and we probably want to keep them secret, but that's actually not. You know, it's exactly the other way around. You know, we're trying to be as open as possible, and so people can learn from it, and we can build a software and better security. Right? Okay. So, um, so what are our sort of approaches to uh, dealing with bugs? And this is a topic, of course, that you're familiar with. And just a little bit of context, basically, before we dive into sort of in more detail into the particular symbolic execution approach. So ideally, correct, we would eliminate all bugs from our code. Uh, and uh, it, in some cases, that's possible. You know, there's a sort of a line of work or research around verification that basically eliminates classes of bugs. And basically, the, the general approach there is you, know, you write a specification for what you'd like your software to do, and then you prove that the implementation obeys the specification. And this approach is a sort of a golden, you know, wish list dream in computer science, you know, from the beginning of computer science, like try to prove your software correct, but it's actually gotten quite a bit better in the last, you know, decade. And the fact that it's sort of being used, you know, for verification for serious, uh, you know, pieces of software. So, for example, some of the crypto primitives in your browser are actually, you know, completely verified uh, from, against a higher level specification. Uh, but this approach, uh, even though it's incredibly promising, you know, is not, you know, yet ready to, for example, you know, tackle the programs that, or the systems that we're actually using on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's definitely going in, in a, a positive direction. It's a very active area of research. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, both Nikolai and I actually participating in this area, trying to prove systems correct, you know, using verification. Uh, 
But this is not the most common trick. The most common way you know, people try to find bugs is just through testing. That's what you've been taught in many of the classes that you've taken here, right, where you write software, you should also write your test cases, um, and, and that way, you know, hopefully eliminate some degree of bugs. Right? And test cases tend to do a really good job in making sure that the software actually has its intended behavior. And that's often, you know, for security, not the case. Right? What we really want to be looking for is for errors or bugs that uh, have unintended consequences. And you know, probably most of the test cases you're right are not of that kind of flavor. Right? Uh, and so, in fact, um, there's another sort of common way in, of finding bugs uh, in the security community, uh, or coming out of mostly the security community, community which is called uh, fuzzing. And we've seen it a little bit show up in a couple papers in the, in the last couple weeks, where the idea is we want to sort of trick, you know, basically cook up really unusual inputs, you know, that you might not maybe be using for testing, just to see if you know, those unusual inputs, you know, trigger some bug in the software, you know, like some core dump. In fact, in sort of way, the very first lecture that Nikolai talked about when he was talking to some website, it was cooking like whatever, 200 A's, correct? Just to see if the, actually the web server crashed. And that's sort of like where fuzzing is very good at. You know, fuzzing basically generates random inputs in sort of a reasonable systematic way, trying to drive you know, programs into strange corner cases that you might not have tested with a test and to see if something goes wrong. Um, and so this uh, has the advantage that may actually get to unknown bugs. Well, testing timely goes for known bugs. Does that all make sense? Okay, so uh, now filters are good, uh, but they're not that easy. You know, so for example, if you have, uh, you know, they might not trigger deep bugs, as the paper calls it. You know, a deep bug is some bug that says like you know, 20, you know, if statements or a number of if branches down deep in the program, and so a fuzzer basically has to sort of guess the right value for each branch to actually trigger, you know, maybe that one bug that sits in like 20 deep, right? And so this, the approach that in the paper is advocated is basically sort of reaction to fuzzer or trying to make fuzzers better by you know, going and using an approach called symbolic execution. And that's basically what I'm mostly going to be talking about. OK, so what's the setup uh, for the paper? Well, the setup is as follows. We have a program that's written in C in this case. Um, and you know, it might have some bugs. And the program takes some input. Uh, and we're going to sort of assume that the attacker has control over the input. So the attacker gets to cook up you know, whatever input the attacker likes. Very similar to like the web you know, lab one, where the attacker gets to control like, what goes in the URL. And the question that you know, symbolic execution wants to answer is, is there a path between the input that could maybe trigger a bug, one of those bugs that actually is present? And so what kind of bugs are we, or sort of the topic? Well, there are a couple. One, crashes. Basically, we need to know, we have a method to uh, determine, actually, if a bug got triggered or not. Well, if the bug causes a crash, we know for sure you know, that the bug got triggered. Right? And so any bug that actually results in the crash and that can be triggered you know, by some input is like the kind of things we're being looking for. And of course, there are going to be different types of ones. It could be divide by zero, or like a null pointer D reference. Those kind of bugs. The other class of bugs that you know, the paper is focusing on is out of bound array accesses. And basically, this is really you know, the class of bugs that can cause buffer overruns. Right? And then the final category 
or, or application specific uh, bugs. And here you should think about the application programmer might be worried about uh, a particular class of bugs in this application code and might write you know, assert statements like you do in C programs or many other software where you want to make sure that that particular condition is true, you write an assert for a statement for, to it, for it. And so you can use these assert statements to basically sort of state invariants about your software. And if one of those asserts goes off, you know, that would be indicating that you know, a particular invariant is actually not true. And uh, the goal of this sort of symbolic execution is to you know, basically try to find, you know, again, inputs that could actually trigger those asserts because that means that some invariant in your program is not correct. Okay? So these are the class of bugs. So the programmer who wants to use the symbolic execution has to do one you know, of two things, which is namely either just rely on crash conditions, but if it wants to have application-specific bugs detection, then the application program has to put like, the right assert statements in the program so that it can be triggered. Right? Because the symbolic execution it's engine itself doesn't know what a bug is. It just drives you know, the execution paths in all possible directions, but it has no way of deciding what actually is a bug is. And so the way you know, EXE or this crash, uh, the symbolic execution decides whether it's a bug, it's either a crash, now to buy an error, or you know, some uh, application-specific uh, assert that is being triggered. Does that make sense? And the second thing the application has to do, of course, is to mark some set of input variables as symbolic so that they, you know, those are the ones that are actually being solved for. Okay, does that make sense? So that's the sort of the setting of this particular paper. And now the goal is to find those deep bugs. So the goal is not to prove absence of bugs. Right? The goal is to find actually interesting bugs that other tools cannot find. And so if they're basically successful, or at least the authors you know, sort of claim to be successful at the point that they can find bugs that other tools couldn't have found or not, or very, have a difficult time finding. Right? So that's sort of the metric of success. And so that also doesn't mean they have to find all the bugs. You know, if they can find for cool new bugs that nobody else has discovered, there, so if you claim is like this approach is a good approach. Okay. And so there are a couple ideas, which we're going to talk about in detail, but um, it's probably worthwhile calling them out. One, we compute in symbolic values. As opposed to concrete values. So concrete values like, you know, the variable x is 10 or, you know, is 12. But instead, what we're going to be doing is we're going to say, well, there's some variable x. We don't really exactly know its value is, but maybe there's some constraints on the value. And that's what we're going to compute with. And so, for example, we're going to mark you know, all the inputs as symbolic. And then maybe if we find a bug, we're going to try to figure out some concrete input that matches you know, the, the input, the symbolic input, so that, that actually triggers that particular bug. Okay. Then the second idea is we're going to create path conditions. And the basic idea there is that like, at every if statement in the program, right, there's some condition being tested. And maybe that condition involves you know, some part of the symbolic value from the input. And the idea is that you know, those, uh, the testing, that if statement, the testing of that condition implicitly uh, raises a constraint or puts a constraint on the input value. Right? So for example, if the branch goes, if it's a true branch, then the condition must be true. If the go to the else, the else branch or the false branch, the condition must be false. And so basically, a path condition is sort of all the sequence of if statements that the code went through and the conditions that had to be true at each if statement to actually get to that particular point in the, that particular point in the execution of the program. And typically, these path conditions are going to involve you know, the symbolic values you know, that are dependent on the, the input. And then finally, we're going to use a solver uh, to see if a branch is possible. So 
So that every if statement you encounter, uh, you compute you know, the path condition for the true case, the path condition for the false case. That gives you sort of a bunch of constraints. They're going to hand the constraints over to a solver. And solver is either going to say, yes, here's some concrete instance you know, for that particular condition. And that, we know that that branch can be taken. And so the program or exe will continue exploring that path. Or the solver might say, I don't know solution. I don't know a solution for this set of constraints, or it's not satisfiable, this constraint. And therefore, we don't actually have to explore the branch any more deeper, because it could never have happened in the real, in the real execution. Like, there's no execution that could have gotten to that particular point. And so there's no reason to explore that path any further. And this optimization of coercion, this, this idea, the third idea is crucial, correct, to the success of this approach, because if you didn't have it, what would happen? This is sort of the homework question. Yeah. Yeah, it would blow up. And you get something what is typically called in this literature, path explosion. Because at every if statement, correct, there are going to be two choices. And it's going to just you know, multiply exponentially you know, as you go deeper and deeper into the program. Right? And so this is crucial to the sort of trying to avoid path explosion. And we'll go in more detail, but that's sort of the basic, uh, basic plan. All right? And those are the basic ingredients of this whole approach. Does that make sense? Any questions about the sort of overall key ideas? OK. So I'm going to uh, use an example. Uh, throughout the rest of the lecture, uh, just to help us understand actually how this works. You know, of course, it's going to be a trivial example, uh, but it will help us you know, understand uh, how the scheme in general works. So the trivial example is we're going to have uh, seven statements. Uh, we're going to read a variable x and y. And the program is you know, super exciting. It's going to test if x, x bigger than y. And then if that's the case, x is going to be y. The fourth statement is another test statement. If x is smaller than y, then uh, we're going to have x is x plus one. This is like not a sensible program. It's just going to be a program for us to uh, understand what's going on. And then six is uh, if uh, x plus y is seven, then raise an error. And you can think about this, these two statements as an assert x plus y, x plus y is unequal to 7. So with the assert being expanded. OK? So this is our program. And the question that we, we're, we're in the game that we're going to be playing is we're going to mark x and y as symbolic. So those are sort of input that the attacker controls. And the question that we want to ask is, for what variables or for what values of x and y might this error be triggered? And uh, you know, even if you look at this sort of particularly simple program, correct, that only has a couple branches, um, it probably requires you some thought to come actually up with the x and y that actually causes that you know, error to be triggered. Right? So like immediately you look at it and you say, oh, yeah, that's it. And basically what you know, the symbolic execution is going to do is going to give us sort of a very principled way to explore all the paths and actually find you know, the, the, the x and the y that actually will cause the error to be triggered. All right? OK, so how are you going to do it? Well, there's a bunch of components to it. Uh, so let me write this down. So at a very high level. For two sort of phases, if you will, or two uh, steps that are going to be happening. One, there's a compile time step. And basically, what's going to happen in compile time, you know, the exe compiler, which is a C to C compiler, will take this program and instrument it. And particularly, what it will do, you know, it will take every if statement and instrument it, you know, so the, the runtime, the exe runtime, it gets control at the point of you know, the, you executing an if statement. Um, it will replace all the symbolic, you know, all the uh, expressions that on, symbolic, uh, on symbolic values with, again, calls out to an exe runtime. 
So basically, you take the programs in, XE runs over it, instrument it, so that at runtime, when your class is a branch statement, you actually call into the XE runtime so that the XE runtime can actually do something interesting. So that's the first step. And then most of all the interesting stuff actually happens at runtime. So in runtime, you're going to then explore paths. All right? So the runtime is so slightly complicated, so let me try to sketch out the boxes where the components that are being involved. So basically, there's some running program, some process. So let's say the app process that's running. I'll need a bigger box in a second. So the application process is running, and you know, for example, it hits a branch, an if statement. Like maybe it hits, you know, sort of like action wire marked as symbolic, and it will find, you know, maybe the second branch statement that's what it's executing. At that particular point in time, you know, XE gets control, and the XE basically says, well, uh, is there a path? Is there, is there, are, there, are there concrete values for which x, you know, this equation is true, you know, x bigger than y? Now, EXE doesn't really know how to do that, but what it does, it basically sets, it sets a constraint to a separate thing, which is called a solver, a constraint solver. Separate solver process. In the paper, it's, uh, the thing is called STP. And basically, it actually sends two constraints, right? One for the true case and one for the not case. So it's going to be a constraint plus the not constraint. Which, in principle, you know, EXE wants to explore both paths, right? It wants to explore the, basically, this path going to three, which is the true case, or fall through, you know, in the false case, and directly door through to four. So it's consent, you know, constraint to the solver. And basically ask the controller, is there a solution to x bigger than y? Since there are no other constraints, this is certainly possible. And so the, in this particular case, and we'll see in a second exactly how it works, you know, the solver will send something back. In fact, the solver sends three possible outcomes. It will say, OK, you know, there is an, uh, an x and y, or there is an, a symbolic value, concrete values that actually satisfy the constraint that you sent to me. or it will say no. Uh, so in the case, there's no concrete instance, there's no concrete values for x and y for which the constraint is true. In that case, we know that we don't, ET knows that it doesn't have to explore any, that branch any further, or it's going to return, uh, basically, I don't know. And really what that is, is the EXC gave a constraint to the solver, and the solver just couldn't compute, you know, couldn't figure out what the answer is, yes or no, in any bounded amount of time. Now, if you get in the paper to use five minutes or something, you know, some number, of, like the, run, the solver run it for five minutes, and if it can't come up with an answer in five minutes, then basically they terminate the solver. And does that make sense? Why would you expect the solver not be able to solve a constraint? I'll keep that line thought in your mind. We'll come back to that in a little while. Uh, but what is clearly going to be the case, and we're going to give you some examples of constraints are very hard to solve. And be actually very surprising if you could solve them. Um, so there are going to be constraints that are hard to solve. And you know, to deal with that case, you know, then the STP will return don't know. And as we'll see later on in the lecture, in fact, uh, EXC basically treats the don't know case in many cases as no. You know, we couldn't find a solution into this amount of time, and so it will not explore that path further. What does that mean? So if the solver returns no, no, XC decides to uh, solve that path no further, or explore that path no further, does that mean that we miss bugs? Yeah, potentially means that XC could miss a bug, right? 
Because down that path, there might have been a solution if you had to run the solver way, way, way longer. Maybe if they run the solver for a couple, like a decade, maybe we'll come up with a solution to this equation. Uh, and then that might have driven the execution in that direction. And maybe in that direction, in that path, there is actually a bug that could be triggered. Right? So again, this is an example where you know, EXE doesn't really always find all bugs. But remember, that's not their goal. Right? Their goal is not to find all bugs. They just want to looking for interesting deep bugs you know, that other tools cannot find. Okay. So depending on the answer, it's going to create new processes to explore a particular path. And the way it does it, it actually communicates to another process, which is called the scheduler. And the scheduler decides basically which process to run next. Right? So every, for, you know, every if statement basically could create a new process. So you have the old process running plus a new process. You know, the next if statement might create yet another process. So you may have many principles, many processes that you could pursue. And uh, EXE has some heuristic for picking some uh, process. And then basically, you know, goes back and starts running that process. Does that make sense? Those are the major components of, EX, uh, of uh, EXE. Anybody remember what the heuristic is that the scheduler uses to pick the next process? Yeah, go ahead. Success? Yeah, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, so the, 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 okay, so basically, sort of, you can imagine sort of two uh, obvious strategies, right? You can go depth for search, depth for first. Basically, you know, you go to some branch and you keep going down, down, you know, that particular path, right? And all the way to the bottom, and then you go back out, and then you look at the other, you know, side of the branch, right? That's the depth first uh, sort of strategy. The other obvious strategy to do is like breadth first search, right? You basically you create two processes, one in the else case, one in the true case, and you explore both, you know, one step, you know, to, to the next branch. And then you explore all the other processes one step out, right? What's the downside of the depth first, first strategy? Yeah. Yeah, it gets stuck in the loop, correct? So if you have a program that has a symbolic loop bound, Right? Then, you know, every time you're going to go around the loop, that is an if statement, because there's a test condition, right? And it's going to be a true and a false case. And, you know, you've got to go keep going, right? And if the loop bound is big, there are going to be many concrete values for which, you know, the true case is true, right? And so you will be going, 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 creating processes. And do you get big coverage at that point? Not really. You're just exploring that one loop. Right? And so what you want to do, or at least what EXE wants to do, of course, it wants to get wide coverage. You know, it wants to explore many, many different paths. And so uh, it makes some intelligent decision uh, in that scheduling process to not just do Bradford search, not just do Bradford search. What it tries to do is to say, like, well, here's a bunch of statements I haven't explored much. I'm going to give preference to that process. So if you've gone many times through the loop, you know, there's going to be the false case, you know, falling out of the loop that has not been explored. And so the EXE is going to say, like, well, I'm going to explore that a little bit further. Does that make sense? And of course, you, know, you can think of other heuristics, and you can refine it, but that's sort of the basic plan. And that's the reason why there's a scheduler here, because there is some you know, choice to be made, and you, know, you can be clever about it. Questions? All good? OK, so now let's walk through an example. And we'll take this example and see actually how it would work out uh, in sort of practice. So we're going to take one path. We're just going to understand like what actually are the symbolic values, what are the constraints that are being generated, the path conditions, and whether we'll find a bug or not. And we also we want to understand when basically this optimization of cutting off uh, a branch actually sort of works out and why it would work out. So we can take that example, and so we're going to have a variable x and a variable y, and we're going to have a path condition. And initially, when we start, uh, you know, x is going to have the value alpha, y just the value beta, and the path condition is just empty. Right? There's no constraints yet. 
So we can execute the first statement, and we'll basically get to the point where indeed, you know, so we have the first statement, x is alpha, y is beta, and we have no path condition. Then we get to the second statement, and a couple possibilities here. Is let's, what we're going to do is we're going to explore the true case. So at the right uh, two, let's explore the true case. So we're going to see what the state is after uh, the statement two executes, but with the true case in the true uh, branch. Well, what is going to be uh, the case? Well, there's going to be still alpha and beta. I haven't done anything to x and y. But what is the path condition going to say? Yeah. Yeah, so in, in terms of symbolic values, what's going to say? Alpha is bigger than beta, correct? Yeah. App process. Create new proc. Is that the word for you looking for? Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, OK. So let's go to, so what, what is the state of this table after statement, after statement three? So we went into the true case. What is this table going to look like? What's the value for x? Beta, right? So this is assignment data, correct? Assigns y to x. The symbolic value for y is beta. And so after this statement, you know, it's going to be beta. This is going to be beta. And the path condition is the same because, of course, we didn't really branch. OK? How about 4? Now we get to statement 4. What happens there? Well, if x is smaller than y. So basically, we're going to take this condition, correct, send it off to the solver. And in this case, you know, x and y are beta, correct? So the question we're going to send to the solver is, is beta smaller than beta? What do we expect the solver to return? Not possible, correct? So we don't have to explore that branch. We can just, the true branch is impossible, so we can just fall through. So this is a place where this optimization actually works because we're going to not create a new process to explore that, the true branch. Good, good. All right, what happens with six? So basically, your same thing, no, just fall through, no fork. So what happens with six? Well, six, what we're going to do, we're going to ask, you know, x and y, x is beta, y is beta. So we're going to ask the solver, you know, please give us two integers, x and y, or alpha, give us two, in, well, sorry. <laughs> Give us an integer such that, you know, beta plus beta is 7. Does that exist? What do we expect to solve for the return? We expect to solve for the return no, correct? Because, you know, it's integers. And so it can't be true that 2 beta is 7, right? So we don't have to explore that further. So we're not doing the uh, true branch either. So we're going to no fork. And we fall out of our exciting program, right? And basically, we're done you know, with this one path of execution in this program. Does that make sense? All right, let's just do, hammer this all through. Let's do one more path. Yeah, go ahead. Very pedantic, but you're missing an Sorry. You want this? Yeah. Double S? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Please, you know, keep me honest. <laughs> and I'm on my toes. It's very easy to make mistakes in this. Um, okay, so let's do one more, and uh, just to really understand how this works. And the reason we're going through this sort of very carefully, because this is going to show up in lab three. You know, this is exactly, you know, the, basically the machinery that you're going to be using in lab three. And I think if you understand the if statement, you basically understand the plan. And the rest you can sort of almost fill in. Okay, so one more path. This is going to be an exciting path. We're going to find the error. Okay, so... Same story, you know, we have an x and a y, and a path condition. And let's go at the two branch, or the two statement, we're going to go the false direction. 
And so that means after the two falls, correct, we're gonna, this is gonna still be uh, alpha and beta. And what's the path condition gonna be in this case? Alpha small or equal to beta, correct? Because we went not, it's the not of the x bigger than y, it's the path condition, because we fell through. Okay, good. Now, uh, we'll execute, we don't execute statement three, correct, because we're falling through. And let's say at the four statement, we're gonna go in the true direction. Okay, so we're gonna evaluate this, and we're gonna explore the true uh, path. And so we're gonna have alpha, we're gonna have beta, and what is the path condition gonna be? Alpha less than beta, exactly. Right? Both path conditions have to be true. This has to be true, and that has to be true. And so if you make this out, there's gonna be alpha must be smaller than beta, correct? Excellent. Okay, so now we're gonna execute the true statement. So that's this, this statement x is x plus one. Right, so we now need to capture that. So at the, after executing statement five, the symbolic values are gonna be alpha plus one for x, and y is beta, because it's unchanged, and the path condition stays the same, correct? So now we get to statement six, and we wanna evaluate you know, whether this can be true, correct? So what we're gonna to send to the solver is some form of the statement, you no, know, alpha plus one, plus beta is double seven, right? That's the constraint that we want to give to the solver, so we're gonna give that, ship that to the solver, and what would you hope that the solver returns? Oh, we also ship the path condition. Uh, yeah, we also ship the path condition, both. Alpha has to be bigger than, uh, smaller than beta in this particular constraint, absolutely. Thank you. We, Sorry? Okay, and just to me, you know, since you're a good solver, you know, what, what, a, what assignment may, you know, what concrete values might the solver propose? Sorry? Two and four? Yeah, alpha is two, or beta is, and beta is four. Any other combinations that are possible? Yeah, okay, good. And just to make sure that, correct, you know, this, you know we're looking for any concrete input that actually uh, makes the condition true. And so what does that mean? So now the next thing that will happen, correct, we're gonna, it says true, and maybe we execute the error statement, so now we get a crash, and, but we have now a set of constraints that can tell us exactly you know, the input values or possibly input values that actually can cause the constraint or the crash, right? In fact, we can run it again and run the program with the values you know, two and four, and we'll know that we'll get a crash. Does that make sense? That's basically the plan in symbolic execution. Um, and it's sort of, you know, some, some ways are very cool, correct? In some ways what we're doing, we're basically using the program to drive the input that actually can trigger the error by executing the program symbolically. And it's, and it's sort of an interesting property, if you will. Like we're gonna run the program sort of just to generate possible inputs that actually can get you to that particular path in the program. Again? Any questions about this? Okay, good. Now, uh, this program is a little bit boring, and you would probably would not be mighty impressed if there was a whole paper and that had an evaluation on this, you know, six lines of code, and showing, well, you know, symbolic execution works, correct? And so, um, so let's talk a little bit more. Uh, you know, they do show Correct. A bunch of programs that actually, you know, they demonstrate on that they're actually doing pretty, pretty, pretty impressively. So let's, uh, uh, so let's see if the. So here is the paper. And so there's a bunch of different pieces of software that they uh, talk about. Uh, one thing is called the Berkeley Packet Filter. Berkeley Packet Filter. Uh, this is a piece of software that runs inside of the Linux kernel. And the you know, idea is that it's used for, for programs like TCP dump. You know, the programmer writes a filter, gives it to, you know, if you have the picture as it follows. You write a filter. And there's a checker to 
see if the filter is OK. That gives it to an interpreter. Uh, so a filter is basically a set of instructions in the BPF programming language. And the set of instructions you know, look like you know, these guys. You know, BPF load, BPF, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, a set of instructions with some arguments. So think about assembly instructions, pretty low level assembly instructions. And then packets come in from the network. You know, those packets we should think about controlled by the attacker because the attacker can produce them. And then the packets run against the filter in an interpreter. So basically we run the filter in an interpreter. And if the interpreter says yes, that means that the packet matched the filter and is returned to whatever program that's trying to read that packet. Good, and we see, uh, so what, you know, here's the, 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 the caption of the table is Linux filter, you know, of def. You know, basically what they used, you know, their symbolic execution engine for is to basically produce filters that will cause the Linux kernel to crash. Right? And so in the particular filter here that they uh, generated was basically has some offset, if you look at this value, which is really, really big, right? 7 f f f f f f f f you know, unsigned long. And so where does this cause a problem? Well, we can look at the, here's the piece of code that they basically symbolically executed. And can somebody explain what the problem is? You know, let me, everybody think a little bit, you know. It's only two statements, so <laughs> how hard can it be to identify the problem? Okay, everybody had a little bit of time to think about it? All right, so what's the problem? Yeah, go. Uh, so if you add over set, uh, over offset and length, they can overflow um, from outside. Yeah. So this requires some understanding about actually how C addition exactly happens for, you know, integers, correct? And what we can see here, if offset, which is the thing that came out of the filter, is really, really big, and we add a length to it that overflows a 32-bit integer, then that overflow number will be very small, right? And that will pass trivially this test, you know, smaller than h lang. Okay, like h lang is maybe 64 or something like that, right? So for any large offset plus some small length that just becomes a number smaller than 64, then this test will succeed, fall through, through, and will actually return on data pointer, you know, from data plus offset. And where will this be pointing? So data is the beginning of the packet. And where will this be pointing? Some far away memory, correct? Where the package is likely to be shorter than this big offset that we just you know, passed into the filter. And so we'll probably be reading or writing you know, to random places in memory in the kernel. That make sense? So that's one example of sort of a you know, Brickley packet filter, the interpreter. It's a pretty well studied code. Uh, a lot of people have tested it. And you know, yet you know, they're able, using this symbolic execution method, to find you know, a real bug in a real piece of software that people have, uh, are using. Right? And so this is sort of the claim, saying, like, see, you know, this symbolic execution stuff is good. Like, if didn't, this six-line program didn't convince you, well, here's hopefully an example that convinces you. Make sense? And then the paper has a whole bunch of other examples. Correct? And many of them fall in the similar flavor. They're basically you know, read and write in some memory location that is out of bounds. Uh, whether it's the you know, UHCP, DHCP server, or like a Perl, uh, what is the other one? A Perl packet, a regular expression engine. Uh, There's a whole bunch of them. Okay? Good. Okay. So, uh, so that's sort of the top level story. And I want to dive into a couple more details here and there uh, to get a little bit better understanding. And one of the things that clearly is very interesting in this whole approach is, is the solver. You know, what can the solver do? Because basically we you know, took some of these symbolic expressions, or formulas as they're called then, and we sent them to the solver, and we hope that the solver solves uh, the, uh, the equation. So uh, let's think a little bit more about that. And it turns out to be reasonable, actually uh, tricky. And in fact, the paper spends a lot of time on optimizations and tricks to basically get the solver to return answers quickly. Uh, now, for us, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but we're mostly going to be treating, and what you might want to think about it for most of this lecture and the, you know, all lab three, is we're going to basically treat this box as a black box. Uh, but you get you a little bit of sense of what it is, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about it. But it's mostly to get a sense. We're not going to be really talking about it in any great amount of detail, and partly because it actually is pretty sophisticated. Uh, technology that we, you know, probably could spend a semester, you know, if you want to take, you know, one of the advanced programming language classes, you can go take, you know, weeks on symbolic execution. Uh, one thing to note is that they built their own solver uh, because they have a very specific problem uh, that they cared about, and by the time they were doing this paper, you know, there were no solvers around that they could use. And but what we're going to do in uh, class or in sort of in lab three, we're going to actually use a solver called C3. Uh, which, you know, is sort of similar in spirit. It solves a lot of constraints for you, and it's actually pretty good, or it's very good, and it's widely used uh, for all kinds of uh, problems. Anybody used C3 in the past? Okay, one person. So this is just to give you a trivial example so that you uh, know what we're talking about. Let's see if I can find it. Okay, here's C3. So I have uh, basically started a Python. I started a Python shell, uh, Python, uh, Python interpreter. I imported C3. I created two symbolic values, x and y, by saying, please, you know, C3, keep me an integer. Uh, I name it x, and the other one I named out y. And now I can actually you know, do constraint solving for them. Right? So I can, for example, uh, send this constraint to C3, and it will solve it for me and say, well, for y is 0 or x is 7, this is a true constraint. Does that make sense? And presumably, OK, this is going to be dangerous. I'm going to try out something that I didn't try before lecture. Uh, so maybe I can do, uh, there we go, 2 times x is double 7. Hopefully, oh, it says no solution. OK, so this is to give you a flavor of like, you know, this is a very high level. It gives you sort of sense, you know, what the black box does. You send it basically a bunch an, an, an uh, equation with symbolic values, and it's going to spit you back you know, either no solution, or it's going to give you instance of x and y, or whatever variables you picked that uh, are going to be going to be true. Now, so let's talk a little bit about the solver. So clearly, Solver has no problem with things like this, correct? x plus y, whatever it is, x plus 7 is y, or something like that, sort of integer you know, type equations. So you clearly can see you can do it actually very effectively. But even, uh, even that is a little bit of a misleading or a simplification. You know, what really is going on actually in uh, exe is that these variables are not integers. In fact, there are bit arrays. So x and y are not represented as integers, uh, at least not in uh, exe, but as bit arrays. And so basically, for example, variable x, x is of the form is something like this. It is, I think the way they write it in the paper is, you know, it's going to be four bytes. It's a 32-bit integer. And it's going to be of the form like x, uh, 3, appended with the bit string, uh, the bit string or bit array x, 2 appended with the bit array x1 and appended with the x0. And each one of these, x3 or x2 or x1, is an 8 bit byte. Or no, x, in fact, in this particular case, it's just another 8 bit bit array. Okay? And so the whole thing, you know. The whole symbolic value is represented for x is basically represented the way to think about it as 32 bits. Does that make sense? So when you know, something like we write an equation of the form x plus you know, 7, really what that is is this bit string correct, plus the bit string for 7. This is going to be whatever 0, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, blah, 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 and then 1, 1, 0. I'm oh, sorry. 1, 1, 1, correct? And so what the symbolic execution engine, or what the solver does, it basically takes this bit array, you know, 
adds symbolically, if you will, this bit array against it. And then maybe you test it against something else. For example, we can imagine a test, you know, whatever. Let's say we test it as one. Right, so if we send this off to the solver. What we're really sending off is a 32-bit array, you know, plus you know, uh, 32 bits representing the number seven. And we're asking you know, whether you know, that is equal to another 32-bit array where you know, the bottom bit is one representing the number one. Does that make sense? And so there's basically some cleverness that needs to go on in the solver to understand what it even means to add things or to, to, to add two symbolic values, correct? Because if you do integer addition or bit addition, you know, you've got to do the carrier, uh, take it over. And so the solver has all kinds of internal knowledge, you know, what it means to do actually, you know, a plus, a minus, a multiply, and things like that. And it turns that back into, you know, some constraint. In fact, it turns it into a Boolean constraint that is then solved by a set solver. So like you, just to give you a flavor, uh, actually, I was going to give you flavor, but I lost it. <laughs> okay, not going to give you flavor. Um, but basically, I, you know, you think about 004, you know, basically, you know, the plus operation is just a circuit, correct? Right? You know, with, you know, bits in coming in. Uh, a, two, a circuit that has an X and a Y coming in and a Z coming out as the output. And we know what the output of the Z is, of the circuit, and we're just trying to find you know, an input that actually allows the circuit to be true. And since you know, this is just Boolean operations, you, know, you can formulate the whole thing as a Boolean expression or a Boolean formula, and you can ask a set solver to give a Boolean instance, an assignment to the Boolean variable so that it actually is true. That's sort of basically what's going on. So the short, Summary of the story is basically the, the solver has all kinds of smart stuff built in to actually understand or to uh, theories about plus, you know, uh, multiply, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the corner, what they, just to, for this picture to be complete, there is a, a library that sits in the site, and that is an SAT or a SAT solver. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, that means that certain other operations are actually more exp harder to solve. Right? So for example, you know, reasonable hard is actually whatever. Uh, x times x times x is 900. Why do we think that it's going to be harder for the solver to solve? You know, what kind of intuition could we develop to actually get some handle on that? You guys did uh, multiply circuits in 004? Are the multiply circuits a lot more complicated than the plus circuits, addition circuits? They are, correct? You know, whole multiply is a much more complex operation than actually uh, a plus. And the, you know, luckily for us, C3 and STP are actually have all the theorems you know, necessary to actually do those kinds of operations, but it's much more costly than, say, for an addition. So solving them, multiply, is just more costly. It's going to take more cycles to actually do. All right, so that's hard. So what do we think about this one? Because since we can give a lot of things to the solver, let's see. We could try out this. 10 is the SHA of 256 x. Well, there's a formula, correct? We could imagine writing this up and giving it to the solver. And basically, ask us to give it a concrete value for x so that this is true. I see a lot of people smiling. Do we expect the solver to return an answer anytime soon? No, right? Because what is the property of Shaw of 256? Yeah, well, so the, the high level property, yeah, exactly right. The high level property is, is hard to invert, correct? It's you know, cryptographic secure. It's supposed to be very difficult to invert that function, right? And so it would be pretty cool, if the, or not so cool, depending on your view, if your solver you actually could solve it <laughs> in uh, less than probably no long time or something like that. <laughs> so we don't expect that to be uh, possible, right? And so this is too hard. And just to give you a little bit of a flavor, sort of the spectrum, you know, for the things that we can think you know, are easy, for the things that are hard, for the things that are basically completely impossible, right? 
law. Anybody remember what STAT stands for? I'm, I'm sure you've seen it in a bunch of the theory classes you've taken. Sorry? Satisfiability, correct? And so what is the problem of satisfying, so if you give a Boolean, you have a Boolean expression, and uh, you have to find instances for the variables in the Boolean expression for which the Boolean expression is true, and what category does that fall? NP complete, right? And so in general, you know, we don't, you know, this is, you know, basically we're asking some, you know, library to basically solve an NP complete problem, right? So we didn't generally would expect, you know, things maybe to turn, uh, to take a little while. Uh, and it turns out that, you know, many, so you might think, wow, that's pretty cool. We got a program that basically can solve NP complete problems fast. That's not really true, right? It's basically true. There's a whole bunch of optimizations and heuristics that are actually very good at solving certain types of Boolean expression that happen to come up, you know, so show up in real programs, right? So to give you a little bit of a sort of sense. Does that make sense? And a little bit more idea of what actually the constraint solver does and why it might be hard. And you can also see why, you know, the paper has spent so much time on optimizations to sort of uh, massage, you know, the expressions that it gives to the solver because then hopefully it will get a fast answer. Okay? So a lot of in the engineering in this paper is actually coming up with the techniques that, you know, allow the solver to return an answer quickly. Okay. So that's integers. Uh, the paper spends quite a bit of time on arrays. Uh, and so I want to say a little bit about it. I'm not going to talk a lot about it, because for the large part, we're going to ignore it. Uh, it won't show up in lab three. In lab three, we're only going to do symbolic execution on integers, real integers, not bit arrays, and strings. And C3 actually has support for reasoning about strings. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about uh, arrays just to give you a flavor about like what you know, what's hard and what's easy, and why, you know, they spend quite a bit of time on the race. So, uh, if we have an expression of the following form, uh, S is an array, or S is an array, but it's a symbolic array, and it's indexed by a concrete value, so like 10 or 11. Uh, is this hard or easy for the solver to solve? So let's say we want to do something S plus, you know, indexing you know, the symbolic array S at location C, uh, which is a concrete file, your number 10, and we want to test if, like, the value is 12. So that's an expression that we could solve to the solver, you know, ship off to the solver, and do we think the solver will give us a quick answer? Why is that the case? A number of people are shaking. Yes? So what is S, basically? What is an array? What is the address of an array? It's just an integer, right? It's just a number in the address space. So basically what we're doing here is we're taking a symbolic integer, we're adding a concrete value to it, test it against another value, and we ship that to the solver. Well, that's exactly like the type of things that we did before, right? And so we expect this to be reasonably easy. And it is. So this is reasonably easy for them. That's not the hard case. Okay, how about this? We have a concrete array, and we index it with a symbolic value. Do we expect that to be easy? So this turns out to be reasonable hard, correct? Because it actually turns, explodes, or it actually folds out into many, many conditions, correct? Because we need to test for any possible uh, concrete index whether this is true. And so the way they you know, sort of set this up is basically, well, if C0 is 1, if C1 is 1, C2 is 1. And so it actually becomes a large, large, long expression. And in fact, you know, if you read the array section very carefully of this paper, this gives us a tremendous amount of trouble. You can sort of understand that, right? Like in the Berkeley packet filter, you know, a packet is basically a symbolic array, right? That is indexed between some value from zero to whatever, some number that is the length of the packet. And so they have, they need, you know, they need to be able to operate on those kinds of arrays, and this gives them a lot of trouble because it expands into basically n uh, different uh, conditions, and then they do some bunch of optimizations. It turns out, you know, it's worthwhile to do some optimizations that actually turns it into n squared uh, type of equation. 
Uh, so this turns out to be hard for them. And they spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to make that work. Well. OK, one more, just to get a sense uh, what the challenge is here. So how about um, star s, where s is a symbolic pointer? Do we expect that to be easy to reason about that or hard to reason about? Yeah, exactly. That's the right intuition. You know, that's the intuition we at least we need for this lecture, which is you know, it's just hard because it could point anywhere in memory. Right? So any memory value is a possible uh, uh, concrete value, and it's going to be hard to reason about it. And so what do they do? They spend a lot of time talking about arrays, and they spend not much time talking about pointers. Yeah. Then it kind of decays to this representation of an array, so s tends x to zero. For certain things, where if they can, oh, sorry, so the, okay, good, thank you for reminding me about this. I, otherwise, I would set something that was not correct. Uh, so there's basically two cases. They know that they have a good idea of what P is pointing to. For example, it points to some struct or it points to some array because the point is derived from an array that's in the program. Uh, but because of alias and you don't know there's no that, and so sometimes they have no information about the pointer. And in that case, what they do is they just pick some concrete value that the pointer uh, has and just run for that with it. And basically turn the symbolic, you know, the pointer from a symbolic value into a concrete value. Right? What does that mean? What it mean, what is, what will be the end effect of that if we turn a, a symbolic value into a concrete value? Does it mean we're gonna maybe find less errors? or fewer errors? Yes, right? And it means that we possibly you know, are gonna miss you know, some errors because you know, we turned the pointer that was derived apparently from some way from the input you know, to a concrete value without actually exploring all possible values that could have been true for that pointer. And so it might be possible that exe misses some errors. Right? And so this is another example where you know, exe is not complete, if you will, or not sound, if you will. Uh, and, and again, their argument, their counter argument is, oh, that's all true, but you know, we do find real bugs. Right? So it's really a bug finding tool and not a tool to prove your software correct. Okay. Okay, how about floating points? Do they handle flo floating point? They don't handle floating point, why not? Why would, you, what's the intuition? Because hopefully you get a, we're starting to build up some intuition about what these solvers can do. Yeah, go ahead. It's a fairly non-trivial decision procedure. Yeah, actually, you know, computing an addition of two uh, floating point numbers is very, very complicated, right? And it's not associative. You have a big floating point number and a small floating point number, you know, the, the addition just may, may do nothing, correct? It'd be, be, the result be the big number. And so they don't model it at all. They just give up on floating point numbers. Is that a big problem for system software? How many floating point numbers have you seen so far in the labs? None, all right? Or fewer of you. So in different systems, system certain kernels and things like that, they usually don't use floating point numbers. And so they basically argue for that class of software, you know, totally reasonable thing to do. Okay, good. Okay, let's uh, take a step back. And I think we hopefully have a reasonable intuition now how all this stuff works, and you know, discuss some of the you know, decisions or some aspects of the design. Uh, so what is the size of the execution tree? As we said, talked a little bit earlier, correct, in the beginning, uh, every time in principle that we uh, hit a branch, you know, we're gonna create a process for the true statement and the, uh, the false statement, and you know, then we're gonna continue. Right? And so one way you can think about this, and you know, the paper shows this in the uh, you know, the picture in the paper, basically where you, if you, let's see if I can show that to make it concrete.
the way you can think about it is that basically, you know, the EXC sort of explores all the possible paths. And you get an execution tree like this, where there's a long, uh, you know, tree of processes that have been created to basically explore the different paths, right? So how big is that execution tree? You know, we sort of already talked a little bit about it, but it's like worth revisiting. Yeah, in theory, it could be exponential, right? And uh, so do we expect, for example, could you take the Linux kernel and symbolically execute it using EXE? Would that be a reasonable expectation to have or an unreasonable one? How many if statements does the Linux kernel have? <laughs> How many statements does the Linux kernel have? Millions, right? And so this is probably a completely unreasonable expectation to have, right? That, you, know, you could actually symbolically execute a really, really, really big software. Um, in fact, you know, like initially when you know, this came up, you know, when they, I saw the paper for the first time, I was just completely surprised that you could even do it at all on anything that actually is a reasonable system program. Like that you could do it on the Berkeley packet filters, that you could do it on the Perl regular expression uh, you know, generator. Correct? Uh, it was like pretty, quite impressive, like real software, you know, and basically you symbolically execute it, even though you have this risk that there's basically a complete path explosion. And so I think that's the right way to think about it, is like that it can be done at all, it's just fantastic. Okay, so we'll explore some other direction. How long will EXE run? Short, long? Yeah, with all the optimizations, they're really reasonable or quick, at least for the cases that they sort of tested it for, correct? But then again, it could be you know, reasonable short with all these optimizations, but you could certainly construct cases, correct, where it would just not terminate. Or in the sense of the right way to think about it is, you know, there's so many paths to explore. The solver times out in every you know, branch that you're exploring. You know, I think the timeout was five minutes, correct? And so there's going to be, a, if there are a lot of branches that actually uh, uh, time out, it's going to take forever to actually you know, basically symbolically execute a program. So it could run very short. Run incredibly long, right? And the one reason they do all these optimizations is to try to get this under control, right? Yep. I'm just wondering what SMC stands for in Arrays, DFS versus. Sorry, what? I'm not sure. Sorry. In the board underneath discussion, you were using SMC to refer to. Ah, thank you. S stands for symbolic. C, so symbolic. C for concrete. Uh, concrete is 11, 10, like a real number. Symbolic is a symbolic, you know, value like one of these 32-bit vector, you know, type thingies. All right. Okay. Um, so another question, and which sort of we answered, but it's worth uh, uh, revisiting. You know, does it, does it find all bugs? It doesn't, correct? As we have pointed out, like there's a whole bunch of scenarios in which it doesn't, you know, find out all bugs. You know, for example, if uh, you know it constructs uh, some uh, constraint, sends it off to the solver, the solver times out after five minutes. You can't find any, you know, concrete values for that constraint, and it will assume that basically that constraint cannot be uh, solved, and therefore will ignore that branch. And uh, that might be the wrong thing to do, right? Because you know there might actually be a solution. Just the solver didn't happen to find it. And so they won't find all bugs. But they do, correct? You know, this approach does really go deep and you know, look at the, uh, you know, we, we saw this in this particular set of if statements here, correct? It really you know, guides, you know, the uh, symbolic execution really guides you know, through all the different paths by just like executing the program symbolically. And so it can actually go deep and you know, find these cases where like you know, 20, 30 branches deep. Uh, and may, you know, find, trigger some error that may be very hard to trigger, for example, using fuzzing, where you're just generating random inputs because you're sort of constructing inputs in a clever way. Okay. Okay, so uh, stepping back, uh, you know, to summarize, you know, at the end of the lecture. Um, 
So first order, you know, the way we want to think about things, you know, in terms of bugs in, in the context of computer security is that if there's a bug in the code, we should more or less assume there may be an exploit. It might be very difficult to construct the exploit. It might involve multiple bugs. You know, you have to do first this get wrong, that get wrong, and that wrong, and line all the bugs up correctly or carefully, and then maybe you construct an exploit. But from our point of view, from the security point of view, is basically we should assume a bug is a reason to think that there might be an exploit. And so bug finding is very important, and the research community spends a ton of time and energy on bug finding, constructing exploits, uh, and so that we can learn and try to avoid them in the, in the future. Uh, you know, we see that symbolic execution is a particular powerful way for constructing possible inputs that could trigger you know, some bug that might be sitting deep in the code, right? like many, many, many branches uh, down that are actually difficult to find either by testing or by fuzzing. Right? And that's what the interesting aspect of uh, symbolic execution. We cannot expect you know, to work always, you know, because you know, there's always this risk of path explosion, uh, and so it needs to be used with care. This is also one reason that they don't mark all variables as symbolic input. You know, only, you know, the programmer has to sort of pick the variables that are being, uh, has to pick the variables that are marked uh, symbolic and which, on which the symbolic execution engine actually uh, operates. Right? And if you, the program does the wrong thing, again, you might not find some bug, right? because the bug is triggered by, some, uh, by an input that you didn't actually symbolically execute on. And finally, uh, you know, probably the most important part for you is you know, this will be the, you know, you basically will implement a symbolic execution engine in uh, lab three, except with a small twist. And something that I didn't really talk about, you know, and I want to talk about now for a second, is how to deal, one, one, somebody actually asked us how to deal with, you know, with libraries or databases, you know, database calls to the file system. Right? Like basically, we sort of assumed so far that we basically have the whole program in our hands and we symbolically execute the whole program. So one way to do it, of course, you could like inline the library into the program and then symbolically execute the program with the library. Uh, but that's going to be presumably costly. Correct? For example, you want to take your database, inline the database with the program and symbolically execute the program and the database, and then you're probably going to run into path explosion again. Right? So you can't always do that. And so the way uh, we're going to get around this a little bit in lab three is we're going to use what's something that's called Something is called concolic execution. And that is a combination. It's a combination of basically symbolic and concrete. It's almost a little bit in the same way, you know, they sometimes handle pointers, where at some point you need to do computation, for example, call on a database function and you have a symbolic value. Well, you can't call the database with a symbolic value. The database doesn't know about symbolic value. So at that point, you just pick a concrete value and you invoke the database with a concrete value, you're going to get a concrete answer back. And so what you're going to be doing in lab three, basically, is for every symbolic value, you're going to also keep track of a concrete value for that, you know, for that symbolic value. And, uh, and that way, you can actually execute ZooBar against real databases and explore you know, maybe bugs in ZooBar. All right? Any questions? Yeah? Uh, how often do ex or, like, adversaries use these like, EXEs to try and find bugs? <laughs> I'm the wrong person to ask. Right? So the, the question is, like, how do adversaries use these tools? Uh, I would imagine absolutely. <laughs> Right? I mean, if you're an adversary, you know, it would be great to find, uh, automatically find bugs that you may be able to exploit. Uh, and so these tools are available. Uh, uh, but, you know, I think something like EC is just to make, you know, so to turn this EC into a real tool is a lot more work. You know, this is a research prototype, correct? Uh, as far as I know, EC is actually not used in uh, practice. There was a follow-on tool called uh, CLE that quite a number of researchers used, you know, for it. Uh, but there are also uh, companies that internally have developed tools you know, on, based on symbolic execution, inspired by some of this work uh, that you know, they use internally to actually uh, do symbolic execution of critical pieces of code. Uh, but yeah, it's accessible to the uh, attacker too. Right? And this comes back to this sort of discussion I think we had a couple times, and you'll see this is a theme in the class. You know, what should, should you keep things public? Should you make things public, or should you keep things closed? 
Right? And this is always a debate in the security community, and people tend to come on on the transparent side because you know, the, it helps the good guys too. Right? Or in fact, you know, his hope is that you know, this will help the two good, good guys good enough that, that they can get ahead of the bad guys. Yeah? I was just regarding interacting with library files and whatever. Yeah. Wouldn't you maybe want to assume that everything else is, if not malicious, untrustworthy, and anything in return should also be consistent symbolically? You could do that too, correct? You could say, like, oh, the database is malicious, and I'm just going to assume that any answer that it returns is symbolic value. Uh, I think that in this case, in the, for example, C3 in the lab, that doesn't really ma make that much sense because the attacker has control definitely of the URLs, but not actually over the database. Okay? Maybe see you on Wednesday.